This will be a really big area in the USMLE because they're going to want to make sure you're acutely aware of what the sexually transmitted diseases are and how they're treated. So first let's just talk about uh, an overview of STDs throughout the world. STDs are a big deal here in the United States, but as you can see, uh, it's actually a much bigger deal in other countries. So particularly Africa, South Asia, and uh, the uh, southeastern part of Asia are most affected by STDs. And this is minusing HIV, of course, because if we included HIV, Africa would be far and away uh, number one. As far as the United States, uh, this is actually not a real good graphic uh, just because it's kind of dichotomous, but uh, there are higher STD rates in the South, uh, and uh, 19 million Americans are infected with STDs annually, but only half of them are aware with it. So. So the sexually transmitted diseases we're going to talk about are those that cause urethritis or cervicitis, which are gonorrhea and chlamydia. We're going to talk about those that cause a painful ulceration or painful lymphadenopathy, and those are chancroid, lymphogranuloma venereum, and genital herpes. We're going to talk about those that cause less painful to painless ulceration, which are syphilis and granuloma inguinale and uh, those that cause warts, which is genital warts. There are other STDs that we're not going to be talking about in this section because we're going to be or have addressed them in other sections. HIV and AIDS will get its own section. Hepatitis B and C was talked about in the GI infections. Pubic lice and scabies and molluscum contagiosum was addressed in the skin infections. And trichomoniasis was uh, talked about in the uh, vaginal infections. The ones that are here in blue are definitely have to know ones just because they're prevalent in the United States. By prevalent meaning you'll probably see them at some point. The ones that are in black here are very rare in the US, meaning that you'll probably never see it in, in real life, but that doesn't mean that you don't need to know it for boards. Okay, first off, let's talk about how we approach the patient with possible STD, and this is going to be important for your USMLE CS, and it's going to be uh, for step two, and it's going to be important for your general practice in the United States. So, obviously, a sexual history is going to be of the essence in any patient where we're suspecting possible STD. A lot of Women come in thinking they have a urinary tract infection, and it turns out they actually have uh, gonorrhea or chlamydia. So getting a sexual history on all patients that have pain in the genital area uh, is going to be of the essence. And a sexual history on any patient, really, where you're getting a, a comprehensive history and physical exam. So how do you take a proper sexual history? And this I put in here primarily for people who are watching this from outside the United States, where perhaps in such countries sexual history is maybe done differently. So as I've mentioned, a proper sexual history is part of any comprehensive examination, and studies in the U.S. have shown that patients tend to not reveal information primarily because they feel that their doctor is going to be made uncomfortable. And doctors tend not to ask for that information primarily because they think the patient is going to be made uncomfortable. So it runs both ways. Both people want to talk or ask about it, but they don't because they think they're going to make the other person uncomfortable. So the onus lies on you as a physician to take that first step and to ask these questions, regardless of the, whether the patient is young or old, um, whether they're Christian, self-described, Muslim, self-described, it doesn't matter. Every patient should be getting a sexual history that's why they're in the, uh, in, in the doctor's office, and of course they can certainly decline if they don't want to share that, but they should be given the opportunity, regardless of who they are. Unfortunately, there's a lot of wrong ways to take a sexual history, and as times have changed and we've learned new things about sexual practices, and more recently about sexual orientation being, uh, being immutable, we have to 
phrase our questions in a way that's going to make the patient most comfortable. So rather than asking the patient, how many people have you slept with, or how many times have you had sex, you would ask the patient, how many partners or how many sexual partners have you had? Because if you ask the patient, how many times have you had sex, some people describe sex differently. Some people describe sex as simply uh, penis, vagina, penetration. But of course, there are other ways you can get sexually transmitted diseases. So how many partners or how many sexual partners have you had is the best way to phrase the question. And then do not ask the patient, are you gay, are you straight, or are you bisexual? Because there are some patients who may sleep with the same gender that don't identify as gay, and there may be patients who identify as gay that may have slept with somebody of the opposite sex. So what you should ask the patient, rather than making them identify with a label, which a lot of people don't like to do, is ask the patient, have your partners been men, women, or both? And then also ask the patient, what type of sexual activities have you engaged in? And the reason you want to do that is because there are certain diseases that can be spread through anal intercourse, or we would want to look at the anus if we're suspecting a certain disease. And it's not right to assume that because the patient is heterosexual that they don't engage in anal intercourse or because the patient is homosexual that they necessarily do. Sexual practices vary by gender and culture and, and sexual orientation and so forth. So you can't go into any sexual history assuming anything. So lots of questions, but make sure that you phrase them in ways that are going to make the patient most comfortable. So how do you approach a patient about a possible STD? So, like I said, sexual history is of the essence. Some patients are going to be very straightforward. These are usually the patients who've been diagnosed with STDs before, and they're just going in for the same song and dance. And there's also patients who may be younger, they may be in a more conservative community, and they might be shy or reluctant to share information. And for those patients, it's really going to be important that you provide them with reassurance and that you... Uh, Pose your body language in a non-provoking and neutral manner, um, and that tends to be very useful in assuring patient comfort. And always remind the patient, even if they know, remind the patient that there's very strict confidentiality, even with family members, that you're not going to share uh, that information with family members. And of course, I'm assuming here patients over the age of 18. In most states, it varies by states, but in most states, you can, there's confidentiality even with pediatric patients, and that kind of varies, but always assume for the USMLE um, that you're keeping confidentiality with patients over the age of 18. And then during any male groin, female cervical, uh, breast, mostly female breast, or any rectal examination, that another staff member is present in the room. And in the US, by custom, and I don't know if there's anywhere where this is written, but what we tend to do is that you have a female staff member present in the room uh, when you're doing this. Now, it doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman clinician doing the exam, you always have somebody else in the room. If you're a male clinician, if you're a male doctor, uh, and you're examining uh, a, a woman, you have to have an, another woman in the room with you. If, if you're examining a man, you could probably have another man with you, but there should never be, there should never be only one woman in the room when that woman is the patient. Okay, uh, so let's first talk about gonorrhea and chlamydia. This is an old public service advertisement, clearly before the days where chlamydia was known about, but illustrating that this has been a problem for a long time. And it says you can't be beat by the axes if you get venereal disease. So this is from the World War II era. So gonorrhea and chlamydia is uh, very variable uh, on race. And of course, that doesn't mean we assume anything based on race, but we should be aware of these things. That, uh, of course, chlamydia is more prevalent than gonorrhea in general among all races. But chlamydia and gonorrhea is significantly more common in black, Hispanic, and American Indian populations. 
whereas it's less common in Asian and white populations. And this is in the United States. This data is a little bit older, but uh, the data has remained pretty similar in proportion. So the main culprits of gonorrhea and chlamydia are Neisseria gonorrhea, of course, and chlamydia trachomatis. And there are other things that can cause non-gonococcal urethritis besides chlamydia trachomatis. Okay, chlamydia trachomatis is the cause of chlamydia, but there's other things that cause the non-gonococcal urethritis. But a majority of non-gonococcal urethritis is caused from chlamydia. So we're just gonna divide this up into gonorrhea and chlamydia. The symptoms for both gonorrhea and chlamydia are the same. So you got UTI symptoms like dys dysuria, burning, urgency, and frequency. They feel like they have to go. They feel like they don't get their urine out. Uh, and then what separates this, though, from a UTI is that you have a purulent to vicious urethral discharge. So never in a UTI would you ever have discharge coming out of the urethra. You can also have fever and nausea and vomiting. And again, that's something that's also not common in a simple bladder infection. In women, uh, you can have intramenstrual spotting, and that would be if you have concurrent uh, cervicitis. So both gonorrhea and chlamydia can cause cervicitis. Of course, a man doesn't have a cervix, so this is only in women. And part of cervicitis can be intermenstrual spotting. That can be a sign. And really what that is is just a friable uh, cervix releasing blood. So it's not really blood from the uterus. You're not having menstruation. Uh, but you're just having blood coming out into the underwear from the cervix because it's irritated. On physical examination, in the male, it's usually going to be unremarkable, but you should try to express any male that comes in with, uh, with UTI-like symptoms or su suspicious of this kind of STD. You should try to express uh, uh, the fluid, the, the purulent fluid from the, uh, from the urethra, but you should also check for pain in the testes because gonorrhea and chlamydia can uh, descend into the uh, epididymis and into the scrotum. In a woman, you should always be doing a cervical exam, which could point you towards the presence of cervicitis. Any woman who has symptoms of a UTI, you're going to be getting a cervical exam as well. So for diagnosis, when you suspect gonorrhea and chlamydia, you're going to get swabbings of the urethra, cervix, rectum, and oropharynx, depending on where the symptoms and practices are. So if the patient uh, says that they don't engage in anal sex and they're not having any symptoms of pain in the rectum, you don't have to get a swab in the rectum. But the ure urethra and cervix at least. Oropharynx can be useful as well. Those should all be done as the initial diagnostic step. And this is done for both gonorrhea and chlamydia, but they're gonna be two separate swabs. And the reason that any time you have, well, let me rephrase that. Gonorrhea and chlamydia clinically are unintelligible. So they look the same. There are some small things that might give you a hint towards one or the other, but as far as the USMLE is concerned, they're clinically, they appear the same. What you're going to know, want to know, is that gonorrhea appears on a gram stain as gram-negative diplococci. And this is an example of gram-negative diplococci here. So, they look like two little donuts sitting next to each other. Okay, the treatment is... Uh, now, if you diagnose gonorrhea or chlamydia in a patient, you're going to treat them as if they had both, gonorrhea and chlamydia. So what you're giving them is ceftriaxone, and that's going to be a shot that you give them in a muscle. And that's just given one time, and that covers gonorrhea. And you're also going to give them azithromycin as a one-time oral dose, and that covers the non-gonococcal causes, including chlamydia. So even though they come back positive with only one gonorrhea or one chlamydia, you give them both of these drugs because we want to cover everything. If a patient is diagnosed with one, you treat them as if they also have the other. And also important, 
to know that you're going to treat HIV and AIDS patients the same way we treat everybody else. And why that's important is because there's some diseases where we treat HIV and AIDS patients with a different therapy. But in gonorrhea and chlamydia, we treat HIV and AIDS patients the same way. You're also going to want to give the patient education. So first off, safe sex. Um, and that safe sex, as far as preventing pregnancy, is not always going to prevent gonorrhea or chlamydia. So what works in preventing gonorrhea and chlamydia? Condoms and abstinence. Condoms probably 98 to 99% when used effectively. Abstinence is 100%. What doesn't work for preventing gonorrhea and chlamydia? Birth control and pulling out. Those can both be somewhat effective as far as preventing pregnancy, but taking birth control is not going to prevent getting gonorrhea and chlamydia. And a lot of women think, and a lot of men maybe, think that taking birth control is going to prevent STDs. That sounds really crazy, but there are a lot of women who think that, and a lot of men who think that. So very important that they know birth control does not prevent STDs. Abstinence is the only 100% way to avoid STDs, and you should stress this, that if you really, really, really don't want to get any STDs, abstinence is the only 100% way to avoid STDs. The less you have sex, the less your statistical risk is to get an STD. You should also warn of the complications of STDs, particularly with gonorrhea, warn them of gonorrhea or gonococcal arthritis. And in women particularly, you're going to want to warn them of pelvic inflammatory disease, which is a, uh, a gynecologic disorder where you have inflammation that ascends into the uterus and into the fallopian tubes and ovaries and can cause chronic pelvic pain and problems with uh, conception and pregnancy. You should also consider a pregnancy test in any woman who's tested positive for gonorrhea and chlamydia since we know that she's had sex. If it's recent, she might want to consider a pregnancy test. Also consider testing for other STDs like syphilis and, of course, HIV. And then this is another picture of gram-negative diplococci. Okay, so moving on to a large category of STDs, those that cause ulcerations. And those ulcerations can be anywhere on the internal or external genitalia or in the rectum. And those that cause notably painful ulcerations or painful lymphadenopathy are chancroid, lymphogranuloma venereum, and genital herpes. And those that cause less painful to painless ulceration or lymphadenopathy are syphilis and granuloma inguinale. So let's start off with chancroid. So here you can see an ulceration on the body of the penis, and that happens to be in men perhaps the most common place to get any kind of ulceration. So with chancroid, you're going to have multiple or solitary painful papules, and these papules start out as sort of little zit-looking things. They look like little pimples, but eventually they ulcerate and then they enlarge and they have ragged edges and the fact that you have multiple of them is important because as they enlarge eventually they're going to coalesce. There's highly active lymph drainage here. You have a gram-negative bacillus facilitating this disease and so there's a highly active immune drainage and that's going to result in a lymphadenopathy. Now chancroid happens to be rare in the United States and when it is found in the United States it is found in non-white men who are circumcised most commonly. Women can be asymptomatic carriers here. So on the US MLE when you do see this because this is the US MLE and you're assuming your patient is in the United States you're either going to have a an immigrant patient or you may have a white married male who's got a good job who flies overseas maybe say to Thailand or India or Brazil and had a sexual encounter there. Uh, on physical, so, okay, so symptoms are going to be, of course, genital pain and groin pain, and that's caused from both the pain from the ulcer and pain from the lymphadenopathy. On physical exam, you're going to see what you just saw in that picture, which is single or various ulcers, and they can be in different stages. 
Uh, they can be different sizes, and you could see papules and pustules, which would be sort of in the earlier stages, or like what I showed you back here, which is more of, of a late stage. And they can be uh, in different sizes. Most commonly, they're one to two centimeters in diameter, and that's quite large. So there's also tends to be significant painful lymphadenopathy. So what you have is a painful ulcer and painful lymphadenopathy with chancroid. And usually that lymphadenopathy is going to be unilateral. For diagnosing chancroid, the most accurate and best first diagnostic step is culture. So what you're going to do is you're going to take your swab and you're going to culture this uh, lesion and, uh, and then you're going to send it to the lab. A lot of times, though, this is treated on clinical suspicion based on history and how it appears. And the reason that it can be treated clinically is because the meds that we give them are pretty benign, easy-to-take meds. It's either a one-time oral dose of azithromycin or a one-time uh, intramuscular dose of ceftriaxone. Either or are effective. You don't need to use both. Now, that looks very similar to how you treat uh, gonorrhea and chlamydia, whereas gonorrhea and chlamydia we treat uh, with both of these. With chancroid, you only need one or the other. Uh, so that's why it can be treated clinically. You don't have to get your, your lab results back to go ahead and treat them, but if the USMLE asks you what's the most accurate or what's the best first diagnostic step, it is indeed going to be culture. And here's another set of pictures of chancroid. Here's uh, two, three, four lesions, a couple small ones. This one looks like it's in a very early stage uh, on the labia minora here. And then this one is outside the labia majora. And this one appears to be multiple lesions that have coalesced. And then here's just a solitary lesion on, uh, on the, the penis. And again, like I said, the uh, the tip of the base of the penis or the, the body of the penis is the most common places for males to be affected. And so here's uh, the inguinal lymphadenopathy. And so here's an enlarged lymph node, which if you were to press this, it would be painful. And then this is the left side of the scrotum here for reference. We don't actually see the ulcer here. Okay, lymphogranuloma venereum. So when you look at this, this looks really similar to chancroid. And so we have this, this ulcer here, and clearly we have some lymphadenopathy uh, right here. And I, this looks like tape from, uh, first I thought it was a tattoo, it looked like a spider tattoo or something, but this looks like tape that he's been stuck with something, I don't know. It looks like, that's just, uh, that's nothing to worry about there. <laughs> Okay, so lymphogranuloma venereum is a single, usually transient, painless lesion. And I want to stress that this is a painless lesion. It ulcerates and it quickly heals. So you might not even see it. After around a month, you're going to get a severe, painful, bilateral, inguinal lymphadenopathy. So two things that separate this already from, from uh, chancroid. One, that the ulcer is going to be relatively painless. It's not going to be painful, we'll put it that way. Two, the lymphadenopathy is going to be bilateral. And you don't see it bilateral here because the man's hand is covering it. This is also rare in the United States and is more common in those areas that I described, like Southeast Asia, Africa, Brazil, India, and so forth. The culprit here is a specific serovar of chlamydia trachomatis, but having chlamydia, being affected with chlamydia, does not make you more likely to get lymphogranuloma venereum. This is a specific strain of chlamydia trachomatis. The symptoms here, are, of course, are going to be, as I described, uh, present, or uh, so it could be either there, or you could have a history of a single painless ulcerative lesion but you can't assume that they have LGV by this alone because a lot of patients can have single painless ulcerative lesions. What you really need to diagnose lymphogranuloma venereum is that painful bilateral inguinal lymphadenopathy. You should underline that. Painful bilateral inguinal lymphadenopathy in association with the presence or history of a painless ulcerative lesion. That's what's going to separate it from syphilis. That's what's going to separate it from chancroid. 
On physical exam, because this is stage dependent, it can vary. You may or may not see the painless ulcer. And if you see the ulcer, you might not have the painful bilateral inguinal lymphadenopathy yet. As far as diagnosis, the best diagnostic step, the best way to diagnose this, this is the most accurate and the best diagno first diagnostic step, even though you might not take a diagnostic step based on history, is to aspirate that lymph node. So you're going to take, you're going to do a fine needle aspiration of this lymph node. And we call this a, uh, a buboid, B-U-B-O-E. But a lot of times this is just treated clinically based on history and presentation. And the treatment here is going to be doxycycline or erythromycin. And uh, we are going to give erythromycin if, the woman, if it's in a woman and she's pregnant. Otherwise, doxycycline. So important to separate lymphogranuloma venereum from chancroid and kind of important to, to differentiate LGV from syphilis. So here's some more pictures. So all of these you can see the, the lymphadenopathy here and none of them can you see the ulcer. So a lot of times you won't see the ulcer in a woman and a lot of times that means that the woman is usually going to present, because it's a painless ulcer, the woman's just going to present with painful bilateral uh, uh, inguinal lymphadenopathy. Whereas in a man, a lot of times he'll see that, that painful ulcer, or that painless ulcer, and he'll present, but he might let it go until, uh, like these patients clearly did, until you have the painful lymphadenopathy. So just recapping, chancroid versus LGV. They're similar in how the ulcer appears and how it looks. However, with lymphogranuloma venereum, the pain comes from the lymphadenopathy. Whereas in chancroid, the pain comes both from the lymphadenopathy and the pain comes from the ulcer. Okay, let's talk about genital herpes. So until now, we've been talking about some rare things. This is very common in the United States. And the way herpes feels is if you've ever had a canker sore, that's how it feels. But these patients have canker sores all over their genitals or all over their labia minora. And I'm sure women could tell you how awful that would feel. Okay, so this is multiple painful vesicles. So remember, a vesicle looks different. It's not really uh, like it's a, it's not a, it's not like you got cut or anything it's a vesicle it's it's more like this like it came from a virus and uh, it's on the genital or anal rectal area or both and often it's preceded by a prodromal phase of itching and burning and that tends to happen with a lot of the viral exanthems a lot of the the viruses that cause rashes a lot of times there's a phase where you don't have the rash yet, but you've got this itching and burning and, and even pain in that area. And then all of a sudden you've got these ulcers uh, and vesicles. Like I said, very common in the United States. And easily this is the most pain, this is the most painful common genital ulcer. I should say this is the most common painful genital ulcer in Americans overall especially white Americans. So the culprit here is herpes simplex virus. Usually it's the type 2 strain of the virus, but it can be the type 1 strain of the virus. The symptoms is going to be multiple painful genital vesicles and ulcers, just like what it looked like on that picture. And a lot of times it's accompanied by fever, malaise, or myalgias because this is a viral disease. And it can be seen anywhere sexual contact is made. So it can be seen in the anal rectal area. It could be seen uh, on the on the scrotum. It can be seen on the uh, labia minora majora. It could be seen even into the cervix. The diagnosis for this is quite simple. You take a sample of the fluid. Uh, so the fluid that comes from uh, from these lesions here. You just take a swab around it. Take a sample of it. And uh, you, you do what's called a zinc smear, which you're not going to do it. The laboratory is going to do it. But that's uh, looking for the herpes simplex virus uh, pathology. And that's the best initial diagnostic step. And I would probably say that that's the most accurate test, too, on the USMLE for genital herpes. And for treatment, you can use various uh, antivirals, acyclovir, 
valciclovir or famciclovir are all appropriate treatments. Any one of them, if they come up on the USMLE, are all appropriate. And they shouldn't give you more than one of these because they're all perfectly fine to use. No one is better than the other. Valciclovir is a little bit more expensive, though, just because of the dosing regimen. It's a little easier. But uh, all of these are fine choices. Patients should inform their partners because they're also at risk. And pregnant women with genital lesions, so if a, pa if a pregnant woman has a history of genital herpes, she should be inspected very clearly for genital lesions um, around or prior to delivery, uh, because if she has genital lesions, then it is recommended that she have a cesarean section. And so here's some, picture, some more pictures, and really they just look like canker sores. If you've ever had a canker sore on your mouth, this is pretty much the same thing. A canker sore can be caused by herpes virus as well. So it's a similar pathology. Okay, so let's talk about syphilis. So syphilis is a multi-systemic, multi-phasic, so multi-systemic meaning it affects many symptoms or systems. Multi-phasic meaning it affects many different, uh, it, it has many different phases in the infection, many different uh, distinct phases, which Generally, this initially manifests as a single painless genital lesion. So remember I talked about uh, genital herpes being a very common painful genital lesion. This is a very common painless genital lesion. Ultimately, if it's not treated, it's going to progress to cutaneous symptoms and neurologic symptoms. And it can also have cardiovascular symptoms and so forth. Syphilis also has a silent indolent phase. The culprit here is Trypanema pallidum, and that's a spirochete bacteria. Spirochete meaning spiral in appearance. So the symptoms, of course, are going to depend on the stage. Primary syphilis is the initial painless genital nodule, and sometimes there'll be some painless inguinal lymphadenopathy, but not, uh, not, not always. And it'll never be painful inguinal lymphadenopathy, like what you'd see in LGB. Secondary syphilis, you'll have uh, diffuse pigmented papules and rash throughout the body accompanied with lymphadenopathy, fever, malaise, and so forth, constitutional symptoms. And then tertiary syphilis, usually between secondary, primary and secondary syphilis usually can occur within the first few months after infection. But then to go on to tertiary syphilis, it's usually multiple years, you'll have an indolent phase, and then tertiary syphilis develops. And that's most commonly neurological in nature and results in loss of motor balance, loss of pain at sensation, and sensory changes. And then, of course, there's the classic argyll robinson pupil, which is the pupil that accommodates but doesn't react to light. Okay, so this is what the genital ulcer looks like in syphilis. So you can see this one I took from Elsevier. Uh, but... Uh, Again, it looks similar to some of the other genital ulcers, but even though this looks like, you'd think, ouch, these aren't as painful as they look. Um, here's some more, and then here's another one. I can't tell if this is a man or a woman. It must be a man. Okay. Now, secondary syphilis, a couple months later, if it's not treated, you can get these rashes all over your body. And usually they tend to be on the flexor surfaces, but they can go, uh, they can be from head to foot. And then you can also get what's called a condyloma lata, which looks like genital warts, but what's important here is that these have a flat top, whereas when we'll look at genital warts, we'll see that they have more of a cauliflower-like appearance, but these have a flat top. You could rest something on top of these. This is condyloma lata. And then tertiary syphilis, I just put this here to represent uh, what, what happens with, uh, with syphilis neurologically and um, what you get neurologically with syphilis is that, uh, that unfortunate change in motor ability and, uh, and this, is, this is known as tabes dorsalis. And this is, uh, the, the ventral stalk here should be uh, pink, like, I mean, this, this is stained, but it should be pink, like, uh, like, like the uh, anterior part here. Um, and then we're not going to talk about the neurostaining. I'm not a pathologist. 
Okay, uh, and then this is called a gumma. This can happen anywhere, and this is just something that happens also in tertiary syphilis, in addition to the neurologic symptoms. Okay, so how do we diagnose syphilis? The best initial step is the VDRL. VDRL stands for Venereal Disease Research Laboratory, and VDRL is the best initial step because it's cheapest. Now, there are false positives and false negatives, and uh, with VDRL, more false uh, positives, I believe. Uh, so we do VDRL because it's more of a screening test. We have to confirm syphilis, though, with a FTA ABS. Don't ask me what that stands for. I knew at one time, but I don't know now. It's not important. FTA ABS is the most specific test for syphilis, and you have to do that before making the formal diagnosis. So VDRL is for screening, best initial test. FTA ABS for, uh, for diagnosis. The treatment is going to be good old benzathine penicillin. It's still the treatment of choice all these 80 years, 70 years later. Um, and primary and secondary syphilis, you can treat them with one intramuscular dose. However, patients who are, uh, have tertiary syphilis, if they have the gumma or they have the uh, neurologic symptoms, then they're going to need 10 to 20 mega units. Don't, you don't have to remember the dose. Just know that they need a longer amount of treatment and they need IV penicillin. Uh, if the patient is allergic to penicillin, if they're primary or secondary, you can use doxycycline in, in uh, substitute of the penicillin. But if they have tertiary syphilis, then you have to desensitize them to the penicillin. So this is a very commonly asked question on the USMLE. Uh, if it's primary or secondary, you can use doxycycline. You should use doxycycline. Uh, for, for patients with syphilis. Uh, if they have tertiary syphilis, though, you got to use penicillin. It's the only drug that's, that's approved. So you would desensitize them. Okay, granuloma inguinale. So back to another uncommon disease in the United States. Less than 100 reported cases per year. And this is a granulomatous disease. So now this is a, this is a non-painful disease. This is a granulomatous disease spread, of course, like all of these, by sexual contact, and the granulomas appear as ulcers on the genitals, and they appear very, very, very painful, and they appear painful because of how they look, but they aren't painful when you ask the patient, or they aren't as painful as they look. Now, these things just get bigger and bigger and bigger. So they start out small, but they get huge, and a lot of times they're described as pungent, beefy red. Now, the symptoms, of course, are going to be a painless red ulcerative lesion, and these are very, very big. Uh, let me show you a picture just so you can get an idea. Look at this. This is huge. It looks like there's even two of them. Here's another one. That's not as big. So the quickest way to diagnose granuloma inguinale is by swabbing the lesion and doing a right or a gimsa stain of the lesion. And what you're looking for, if you remember back to step one, is you're looking for those things called Donovan bodies. You don't have to remember that now. Just know you're going to get a, a stain of the lesion, a right gimsa stain of the lesion. And that's perhaps the best diagnostic step. However, the most definitive test, so the most accurate test, is going to be to get a punch biopsy. I don't know. If I had one of these, I don't think I'd want a punch biopsy, but apparently they're not painful. So most accurate test is a biopsy. But the stain of, of, of the lesion, the right gimsa stain, is the quickest way, the best first step in diagnosis. The treatment here is going to be either doxycycline or trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. Of course, in pregnant women, we are not allowed to use either of these, so we would use erythromycin. Um, pretty much for any STD, you can pretty much say that erythromycin is the STD to use in pregnant women if the other uh, drug is not allowed. So uh, again, this is more common and more commonly diagnosed in men. Why? Because anything that's painless tends to be more commonly diagnosed in men because in women, it's not, well, let me just say in men, it's, this is going to be very obvious to any man when he goes to the bathroom. For a woman, if she has a painless lesion and it's inside her vulva, that's not necessarily going to be noticed immediately. 
Okay, genital warts. So genital warts is pretty common, and this is a viral infection from HPV, and it results in multiple pedunculating cauliflower-like growths. How do you like that? Cauliflower-like growths on the external or internal genital mucosa. And the culprit here is human papilloma virus. So these, so having genital warts does not necessarily mean that the patient is at higher risk of getting cervical cancer. Remember, HPV is also a risk for cervical cancer. They're different strains of the HPV uh, virus. So it, uh, genital warts tend to be the other strains, not the cervical cancer strains. So the symptoms are going to, generally the patient's gonna know I've got genital, I got warts, you know, um, but uh, the symptoms are as described. They tend to start out as small, moist papules, very unassuming, and they just get bigger. No pain is involved in these. These are just growths. Important to differentiate this from secondary syphilis. Remember what we talked about, that condyloma lata? And remember that we said the condyloma lata and syphilis are usually flat-topped, whereas these tend to be more domed. Uh, diagnosis, clinical. These look pretty obvious. The treatment can be medical or surgical, depending on the severity. If they're just small, you can use medical therapy, imiquimod or podophyllin. Uh, surgical therapy would include cryotherapy, sclerotherapy, curatage, or laser removal. I've actually sat in on one of those laser removals. They're pretty cool. Okay, so uh, stay tuned after the recap. I got something to share with you. So just recapping, gonorrhea and chlamydia symptoms are going to be dysuria, urgency, urethral discharge. Uh, diagnosing is going to be swabbing with gonorrhea. The USMLE will often tip you off by the fact that you've got uh, gram-negative diplococci. The treatment, if you have one, you treat both. Ceftriaxone hits the gonorrhea, or I'm, yes, ceftriaxone hits the gonorrhea, azithromycin hits the chlamydia and other organisms. Chancroid is a painful one to two centimeter ulcer that also has a painful inguinal node, but it's an ulcer that is also painful. Gram stain and culture for diagnosis. Treatment is ceftriaxone or azithromycin. Lymphogranuloma venereum is a painless ulcer, but very, very, very painful bilateral inguinal lymphadenopathy. And the diagnosis here is going to be needle aspiration of that node, or it can be clinical. We give doxycycline to these patients, of course, substituting with erythromycin if the patient is pregnant. Genital herpes, multiple small painful ulcers. Uh, they look different from your other ulcers. They look like uh, canker sores. They're smaller, they're whiter. We smear the ulcers and uh, we do the Zank smear, which is diagnostic. And to treat this, we use either acyclovir, valcyclovir, or famcyclovir, which I didn't put on here. For syphilis, usually it's a painless nodule. There's skin manifestations and a gumma or neurosymptoms, depending on how progressed it is. Primary would just be the painless nodule. Secondary would be skin manifestations. We like to catch it by then. Then there's a long latent period, and you can get a gumma or neurosymptoms, cardiovascular symptoms, and so forth. To diagnose this, we do our initial VDRL, venereal disease research lab, and then we follow that, if positive, with an FTA ABS test, which is diagnostic. We treat this with benzathine penicillin, and we use a higher dose if there are neurosymptoms. We can use doxycycline, but only in patients who have primary or secondary syphilis, not in patients who have tertiary syphilis. Those patients, if they're allergic to penicillin, must be desensitized. Granuloma inguinale is that large, beefy red lesion that's actually not really that painful. And it's not common in the United States, but uh, it's diagnosed with a gimsa or a right stain. And the treatment here is doxycycline or with Bactrim, trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. And of course, if the patient is pregnant, erythromycin. I should say or erythromycin. Genital warts are stocking, pedunculated, cauliflower-like growths. They're diagnosed again clinically. And treatment is going to be either medically with podophyllin or amiquimod uh, and or surgically with various surgical techniques. Okay, so if you stay tuned uh, this far all the way to the end, you deserve a little treat. So this is a syphilis poem, and it's 
I'm not trying to be unprofessional here uh, because this is a real disease, but this is good as far as a mnemonic. So we can be unprofessional if we keep it to ourselves and uh, between professionals and, um, and we uh, use it as a mnemonic to help our patients. So this poem goes like this. There was a young man from Black Bay who thought syphilis just went away. He believed that a chanker was only a canker that healed in a week and a day. But now he has acne vulgaris, okay, he's getting into his secondary syphilis, or whatever they called it in Paris. On his skin it has spread from his feet to his head, and his friends want to know where his hair is. You can get alopecia as part of secondary syphilis. There's more to his terrible plight. Okay, tertiary syphilis. His pupils won't close in the light. His heart is cavorting, his wife is aborting, and he squints through his gun barrel sight. Arthralgia cuts into his slumber, his aorta is in need of a plumber. But now he has a tabies and saber-shinned babies. This is talking about congenital syphilis. Well, of gummas, he has quite a number. He's been treated in every known way, but his spirochetes grow by the day. He's developed paresis, has long talks with Jesus, and he thinks he's the queen of the May. And that just goes on to show you that neurosymptoms ultimately will give way to psychosis. And that's the end.